Um, so our, our panelists in this session is Arlene Fiore at MIT, who's a HACAST member, Yang Liu, who's also a HACAST member at, member at Emory University, uh, Leticia Noguera uh, from the American Cancer Society, and Alberto Ayala from the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. And so, as Jenny said, everyone's going to have about uh, 10 minutes to present, and then we should have about 30, 35 minutes for open panel discussion and questions afterwards. Um, so Arlene is going to present first, and she's sharing. And uh, once you're ready, Arlene, yeah. Great. Can, every, can you see that, Jeff? I, or... It looks great. Yep. OK, great. Excellent. So um, thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, what I wanted to do with this opening slide is introduce our investigator project team, uh, who are all part of our proposal for HACAST. And today uh, we'll provide some updates on our work at this intersection of air pollution, climate, and public health, um, which for this project we're really focusing oh, uh, largely over the northeastern US. So, um, by way of introducing the first part of our project, there we go, um, that I'll talk about today. I wanted to motivate it with really some questions that we found ourselves often getting, particularly from uh, the health community who was interested in what's the best air pollution exposure product to use in health studies. And so this then begs the question, how much uncertainty is there in our air pollution distributions? And so uh, this led Koai Mariantiana Kimortsuglu at uh, Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health to uh, propose successfully to NIH a few years ago to develop a statistical approach called Bayesian Nonparametric Ensemble that ingests multiple US-wide multi-year exposure data sets to give what we can think of as a best estimate product plus estimates of uncertainty. So the, the idea here is why should we have to choose a single product? Can we get what, what sort of the best parts are from each of them? And so Sebastian Rowland, who's a graduate student working with Marianthi on this project, has been is currently fine tuning annual and daily mean PM 2.5. And I'll note that for the daily mean PM 2.5, it's an almost two decade product. Uh, my group is involved in uh, Marianthi's project for NIH and identifying independent data sets for external validation, where external means data sets outside um, of the AQS data that, um, as I'll mention in the next slide, is used in part of this uh, Bayesian for ensembling framework. Okay, and there's plans under this work as well to adapt to ground level ozone and NO2. So our HACAST work is really building on this project led by Marianthi to try to optimize the um, for the northeastern US region products uh, of PM 2.5 ozone and NO2. And so our current status is really that we're looking to assemble the highest resolution possible input data sets for the Northeast. So if you have some you'd like to see used, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And similarly, if you have nationwide products as well, um, so that we can investigate how these air pollution distributions and their uncertainty uh, co-vary both across pollutants, but also um, with meteorology, demographics, and social vulnerability. And so just to walk you very, very quickly at kind of a very high level um, through the process, Sebastian Roland kindly provided this schematic um, where we have, for instance, five annual mean PM 2.5 exposure data sets um, in the top row that are put into this BNE. And then in a first stage, um, there are weights that are, are spatially interpolated um, at each point in time as well via comparison to the AQS measurements to decide how much weight each of these individual PM 2.5 products should get. Um, a spatial offset also comes out that um, at least the way I'm thinking about it is kind of a way to correct for any um, systematic biases that are common across um, the different input data sets. Okay, so where do we land? Um, eventually, we get this best estimate here um, shown. And again, I should say this, this is not necessarily a final product yet. It's a, it's a getting close though. Um, they could be used in some of these applications that I mentioned here. Um, what we're especially excited about is to have this estimate of uncertainty in space and time in air pollution distributions that can be directly linked to epi studies um, and also useful for air quality model evaluation, especially if we can link uncertainties to specific processes um, and thereby help to improve the models for the future. And in our discussions with our air quality management stakeholder partners um, at some of the state air agencies in the Northeast, as well as NESCOM, 
um, it seems like there are some interesting potential applications for this product there as well. Okay, so thinking about metrics that are of direct relevance to climate, uh, this is work by Columbia University Earth Institute postdoctoral fellow Cascade Tucholsky, who's working um, with Alex Desherbinen at Season, um, and which is where uh, Koe Susanna Adamo is. And they are working to develop this data set of dangerous hot humid days, where dangerous is defined as a day when the wet bulb glow temperature max exceeds 28 degrees Celsius. And we see that the southern US is particularly vulnerable um, to, to these high heat events, perhaps not surprisingly, and that there's um, at least a day and in some cases a few days per year, even in the New York region. What Cascade's data sets um, that he's currently producing are going to improve upon is the spatial resolution, getting to 0 0.05 degrees or roughly five kilometers by five kilometer spatial resolution. Um, and also um, starting to be able to look at changes over time. For instance, over Houston, it looks like there's potentially been this increase in the incidence of these dangerously hot days. Um, in discussions with our uh, stakeholder partners, including Koai Tabasaminsaf at New York State Department of Health, um, they're very interested in incorporating new data sets that Cascade is producing into a revised version of the New York State Heat Vulnerability Index that they have available on their environmental public health tracking portal. And in addition, um, analysis of these products uh, will help inform the Climate Health Impacts Compendium being developed under a related project uh, called Building Resilience Against Climate Effects. Also wanted to just highlight this uh, gridded at one kilometer social vulnerability index um, developed by uh, Susanna Adamo and colleagues at Season. Um, there's five time slices available. In the interest of time, we're just showing 2018 here. The purple colors are more vulnerable. You can also look at changes, for instance, from 2000 to 2018 shown on the right. And this is particularly important for comparing with gridded air pollution products, um, for instance, coming out of the statistical framework I introduced um, at the beginning. For the remainder of the talk, I want to switch gears to talk about another part of our investigator project that's aiming to help provide information relevant to guiding um, ozone precursor emission control strategies in the New York City area. Um, for instance, the, the New York City metropolitan area, and especially including the shoreline of Connecticut across Long Island Sound, is um, a of an area that struggles with non-attainment. And so we're interested in how this changes um, as control measures are implemented and also with climate change. But before we hit those long-term scales today, I'm just gonna focus on the first work being done by um, graduate student Madankui Tao at Columbia University, who is focused on summer 2018, when we have a wealth of independent data sets available from the Long Island Sound Tropospheric Ozone Study. So she is focusing in on more specific questions. Can we detect changes in ozone forming chemistry on days when ozone exceeds 70 PBB? And is the view from space consistent with observations from airborne, which I'll show you in the next few slides, and um, Talma will tell us at the flash talk session tonight about the um, what she's finding from ground-based platforms. I want to acknowledge many collaborators and also just note um, the definition at the bottom of the slide, which is how Talma defines exceedance days uh, versus non-exceedance days. And note also that to um, classify ozone forming regimes, we're building on previous observationally derived uh, values of formaldehyde to NO2 that mark the transitions between uh, different ozone formation regimes. That was work done by a former graduate student, Xiaomeng Jin, in our group. Okay, so in the next few slides, you're looking at aircraft in the top, uh, which this is. these are retrievals from the GCAS and Giotasso instruments, thanks to Laura Judd and Scott Jans for their products, and Tropomi satellite uh, retrievals in the bottom row. And what this is formaldehyde that we're looking at here on five non-exceedance versus five exceedance days, we see consistently higher formaldehyde on the exceedance days. We also see consistently higher tropospheric column NO2 on the exceedance days in both the aircraft products and the tropomi products. Um, and when those are combined together to look at the ratio, what Tauma finds is that the changes in formaldehyde really dominate the overall changes in the ratio, which increases. Another way to think about this is this blue and green area, which is our NOx saturated uh, ozone kind of urban core chemistry where the, the um, ozone may increase as we decrease NOx or increase with additional VOC. That area is shrinking 
ranking on the exceedance days and the area in our domain under transitional or NOx sensitive chemistry is, is increasing. Um, importantly, tropomy is suggesting higher sensitivity to NOx than the airborne sensors. Um, and I'll just note that uh, Tauma is beginning to analyze some 1.33 kilometer resolution CMAX simulations provided by Alex Karambelis at NESCOM, who we're working very closely with um, to, to do more analysis. Okay, and we're hoping if there are other high res um, satellite products available, we'd be happy to take a look at those as well. In the final uh, 15 seconds I have here, I wanted to finish out and tie this back to climate. Uh, we have some work uh, published last year with a former Columbia undergraduate researcher, Jake Namark, shown here, who basically found that both NO2 and formaldehyde increase under drought conditions. Um, I think not surprisingly, we know that formaldehyde and NO2 both have a strong temperature sensitivity because of the um, biogenic emission sensitivity to temperature, um, and in some cases, even anthropogenic sensitivity, um, anthropogenic emission sensitivity to temperature. What was a little surprising to us is we actually found an increase in formaldehyde um, associated with drier conditions in the southeast. And so we have a Jake hypothesized that um, this could there could be a role for monoterpenes here in addition to a short term isoprene response. Um, we think this is something that could probably be field tested with observations. And ultimately, we want to understand how if drought changes under climate change, that's going to influence ozone and PM and ultimately health. So um, thank you so much for your attention. I'm looking forward to discussion. Thanks so much, Arlene. Um, so we're just gonna move between speakers and have questions later. So we're gonna go directly into Yang Liu's talk. So Yang's at Emory University and is a HACAST member. Um, are you sharing? You're gonna share your own screen or do you want Jenny to do that? Uh, I can share my screen. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And thank you all for attending this session. Uh, let me start sharing my screen. Let me see. Um, oops. You see my slides? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I want to first thank our uh, project team uh, members, uh, me, Lu Hua from uh, Emory University, uh, Dr. Leticia Nogueira from American Cancer Society, uh, Dr. Guan Yu Huang from Spelman College, um, Adlin Yerkes from National Association of Chronic Disease Directors, and then uh, Dr. Ian Hamilton from the Lancet Countdown uh, Project. Uh, overall, our project, the, the goal is to uh, use Earth observations to support national and global environmental health research and surveillance systems. Uh, we have three core projects and currently participating in two uh, Tiger Team projects. Our uh, first core project is to um, expand the coverage of surface level UV radiation information uh, for the CDC tracking network um, and the uh, NACDD skin cancer dashboard. And uh, we, through, through a previous uh, NASA funded project, we have generated uh, uh, from 2004, uh, 2005 to 2015, uh, surface UV uh, urethmal daily dose information for the continental US. And under the HACAST uh, uh, project, we're expanding it to uh, more years and also to cover Hawaii, Alaska, and hopefully the Pacific Island jurisdictions. Um, current status of, of this core project, um, as reported by the project lead, uh, Dr. Huang, is that we have completed the gridded county level daily UV EDD production. Uh, because the uh, study period goes beyond just OMI, uh, we also integrated a GOM and Skiamaki information for uh, 1995 to 2004. Now, you, you, you may notice the two uh, figures at the bottom of the slide show different spatial patterns. On the left, that's a uh, October 1995 uh, county level monthly mean EDD data over the contiguous US. On the right is uh, monthly mean uh, EDD in October 2004. Um, this you know, spatial pattern uh, differences 
are caused by uh, the uh, different you know, sampling conditions. Uh, for Gom and Skiamaki, out of the, uh, we grabbed the data from the uh, uh, ESA TANIS operational product, um, and it reports cloud-free conditions. Uh, on the other hand, the OMI product considers uh, cloud modification. So the next step is uh, a, a, to first uh, provide a population weighted estimates uh, to be compliant with the CDC tracking protocol. And number two is to, to try to um, do our own correction for cloud impact so that we can uh, produce uh, kind of internally compatible and consistent time series. And the third uh, target for the next step is to explore tropomi UV data uh, and see if we can uh, provide a potential to continuously grow this, uh, this time series. Uh, our second core project is uh, to assess the association between exposure to air pollution and wildfires in the US uh, with uh, cancer survival, in particular uh, lung cancer survival after, uh, after treatment. Uh, we are still kind of early in this, pro in this project. Uh, we're building the uh, model fitting data set. Uh, this project is led by Dr. Nogueira from American Cancer Society. Uh, currently we have uh, received over 546,000 lung cancer patients, the information of these patients uh, with their discharge date uh, covering a 16 year uh, time span. And we're using the uh, geocodes of these patient information currently at, at the you know, zip code level to uh, match Modi's fire, active uh, uh, fire spots data. And the two figures at the bottom just shows their spatial distribution. Um, as you can see, the, uh, the ACS cancer data is very comprehensive. This database ca uh, captures 60 to 70% of all cancer patients in the United States. And the, the next step is to continue the uh, uh, training data development. This is a pretty complex process to construct a, the, the proper data set for a survival analysis. And we're gonna explore two different matching approaches. Uh, one is to uh, build a five kilometer search radius around each uh, zip code centroid of the patient and then try to match uh, fire spots to that buffer. And the second uh, approach is to directly uh, count uh, fire spot centroids within the zip code. And uh, after this compilation, we're gonna construct the uh, proper epidemiological model and then compare our results for these uh, two different uh, data matching approaches. And uh, I'm sure uh, Leticia will be able to provide more, more information about the, uh, the progress. Uh, our third project is to support the, uh, la the Global Landsat Countdown project. This is a global climate and health uh, surveillance system. And our contribution is the uh, global wildfire exposure indicator included in the uh, annual Landsat Countdown report. Um, we have delivered data and then the write-up for the Countdown 2021 report, which is published in the journal Landsat. We have also contribute, contributed to the uh, Countdown 2021 US policy brief, which is a companion document that highlights the uh, uh, climate and health events in the in the U.S. with uh, policy significance, and uh, the, the the figure at the bottom just shows what's included in the report. This indicator has two uh, kind of two parts. One uh, <clears throat> is a satellite-driven wildfire population direct exposure uh, uh, derived from satellite data. Uh, the second part of this indicator is a uh, estimated fire danger uh, indices uh, provided by uh, simulated uh, ECMWF ERF ERA5 uh, data. Uh, in, in terms of the uh, US brief, uh, this year we provided uh, some additional calculation and results regarding the wildfire incidents 
in the uh, Western United States. As you can see in this figure, um, the general finding or the, the, the take home message is that over the 20 year span, we observed a uh, advancement of the onset of fire season in the Western US. It's moving uh, as early as February now, as compared to uh, early 2000s. And uh, that, that is uh, kind of indicated by the, uh, the shortening of the dark blue bars as we go up the vertical uh, um, axis. And then another finding is the lengthening of the fire season and then the darkening uh, or the overall intensification of the fire incidents. Uh, that, that is shown at the, at the right-hand side at the, the kind of the, the darker and darker uh, red shades uh, of, uh, that represents cumulative numbers of wildfires measured by active fire spots. Uh, the next step in this project is to uh, perform cloud correction on fire spot data in the 2022 report. Uh, and that would actually change, change some of the spatial patterns and probably rankings of uh, uh, national uh, wildfire exposure. Uh, also, the second uh, consideration is to improve graded data resolution from the current 0.1 degree to globally 0.01 degree in the 2023 report. This is related to the filtering of population center and a non-climate uh, related, no, you know, non-wildfire uh, uh, activities. Uh, and then we're participating in two uh, Tiger Team projects. One, the first one is led by uh, Pavan Gupta, uh, and this one is to evaluate current uh, NOAA GOSAR PM 2.5 data against the air now ground observations. And our contribution or our, our responsibility in this project is to uh, perform uh, evaluation on systematic uh, model biases. Uh, so far, we have done preliminary evaluation of the GOES RPM 2.5 data. Uh, as you can see at the bottom uh, uh, of the slide, on the left-hand side, we, we demonstrated that the, uh, the absolute bias of ghost RPM 2.5 in, in the continental US increases with PM 2.5 levels, uh, which is to say the higher the PM concentration is, the greater the uh, positive bias uh, ghost RPM 2.5 has. And we, we did a, a spatial analysis of that, and, and it seems to uh, indicate that the underestimation appears to be associated with fire smoke. And we're gonna continue that line of work. And then the, the second Tiger Team project is, uh, on, is, is led by Susan Annenberg. And here is to meet uh, stakeholder needs for, uh, to, to identify communities disproportionately affected by environmental health risks. And so far we have identified South Coast Air Quality Management District as our stakeholder. And uh, their topic of interest is, is actually air quality impact of e-commerce warehouse uh, boom in Inland Empire. As you can see at the bottom of the slide, on the left-hand side, the, the pink block shows the warehouses in this region. And there are absolutely, they're absolutely booming. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that the yellow dots are the location of schools and community centers. They're heavily impacted by uh, truck routes and then all the uh, uh, congestion and air pollution uh, induced by this very heavy tra uh, truck traffic. So uh, our next step is to collaborate with the South Coast AQMD to uh, uh, design a study and then come up with a work plan. And that's all I have, thank you. Thanks, Yang, that was great. Um, our next speaker is our first um, stakeholder speaker. And this is, who's also a collaborator on Yang's project that we just saw. So Leticia Noguera uh, from the American Cancer Society. Um, so Leticia, I don't know if you want to turn your video on and um, if you can share your screen. Can, um, can you see it? I see it uh, in, if you can go into like slideshow mode then. Cause right now I see the, yep, looks great. All right. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk here. As uh, Yang mentioned, we are, um, working together on one of the studies using satellite data, but I wanted this talk, I mean, it's in early stages. And I wanted this talk to be more of a um, 
big picture thinking for all of the one, all, everybody in this uh, work group and in this um, meeting session. So um, we can have more ideas and more ways to use this data. So climate change is the greatest threat to human health of our time. And whenever we hear that, many times during discussions and, and I've seen uh, scientific discussions and um, some government reports, you think about rising sea levels or increase of um, incidence of vector-borne diseases, but really climate change is already impacting health. And I think that there's a big role for satellite data to help us understand how, how it's doing so. Take a wildfire activity, for example. Yang just presented a way better graph than the one that I tried to <laughs> make here, showing that uh, wildfire activity, which is closely tied to temperature and drought, which are being uh, affected by climate change, has been increasing no matter how you measure it. So uh, you have here um, uh, the y-axis year since 1990, and then on the x-axis month. So you see that it's been um, lasting longer and um, there are larger fires and there are more fires every year. And that combined with the growth of the wildland urban interface, which is the area where the houses and wildlife vegetation intermingle, leads to an increase of, ex of exposure to wildfires. So the wildland urban interface has also been increasing since 1990, no matter how you measure it by area, by housing units, by population. And it might not be where you expect if you're thinking about California as we're looking at this, if you look at this uh, map of where the uh, wildland urban interface actually is, there's a lot of it that it's on uh, the East Coast on the Eastern US too. So it's very important that we use data that uh, covers the entire United States and of course international data as well. And the wildland urban interface is not only where people are more likely to be exposed to wildfires, it's also where wildfires are more likely to be ignited. And of course, um, wildfire exposure goes beyond exposure to wildfire smoke. Wildfires burn everything in your path. There's biomass, of course, but also man-made materials. So the smoke created by wildfires is different. Not only that, you have to also think about the necessity to evacuate and the um, damage to infrastructure that can impact access to care, especially for individuals that have been diagnosed with chronic diseases such as cancer, for example. And cancer diagnosis and treatment, of course, at the American Cancer Society, we focus on cancer patients. And cancer diagnosis and treatment leads to several physical, psychological, and socioeconomic consequences, including organ damage, uh, anemia, dehydration, that can make individuals more sensitive to the health threats of climate change and wildfires and other extreme weather events. Cancer diagnosis and treatment also has socioeconomic consequences. I think everybody has heard just how expensive cancer treatment can be. And due to these out-of-pocket expenses and changes in the ability to remain employed, uh, cancer patients are more likely to experience financial hardship, which makes it harder for them to prepare and respond to disasters. It impacts their ability to evacuate, to stockpile food, their ability to adapt their housing infrastructure, like improving insulation or air, uh, air conditioning during heat waves or installing air filters during uh, wildfires. So climate change is uh, increasing the frequency and changing the behavior of ex extreme weather events. And that can, of course, damage medical infrastructure, break transportation links, and disrupt supply chains that are going to have an impact in access to care. Not only that, but extreme weather events lead to an increased exposure to carcinogens, wildfire smoke, or if you think about when Hurricane Harvey hit Houston and the Arkema chemical plant flooded and um, all of the industries in the Houston ship channel uh, were flooded and ended up releasing some uh, carcinogens in the environment. And of course, if you're an individual who has already been diagnosed with cancer or any other chronic diseases, you're going to be more sensitive to exposure to these uh, pollutants. So as we were talking about wildfire smoke is different than uh, just uh, combustion of, of uh, fossil fuel. I apologize, I have a 15 month old at home today who, who has been contact traced from daycare and he's upset that he cannot be in their room right now. Um, so it has these different chemicals that can lead to health consequences. 
And of course, wildfire smoke just doesn't stay in one place. Uh, it travels, which is another uh, fact that is important for, for us to be using satellite data because we can differentiate between proximity to a wildfire, which of course in, includes the stress of being nearby or, or the, the necessity to evacuate with exposure to wildfire smoke farther away from where the wildfire is located. And that is, of course, only one of the many different extreme weather events and other climate change threats uh, that we can look into. If you think about uh, the, the uh, most commonly thought about, I think, uh, consequence of climate change, which is heat and heat waves, uh, it's not only the temperature and the humidity that can impact it. When uh, there's a heat wave, there's a, a worsening of the air quality because um, the pollutants get captured in urban areas and also they are, they are transformed into sometimes more damaging pollutants. And when there's a heat wave, there's an increase in power usage, which also increases the release of these pollutants in the environment. So another uh, project that we've been starting looks at heat exposure um, among vulnerable populations, and that includes, of course, individuals who have been diagnosed with cancer. But you can also think about communities that have been targeted for marginalization and how uh, they're more, more likely to live in um, intra-urban areas that, that have a higher incidence of um, urban heat islands and also have a, a socioeconomic status um, and barriers to improving their access to air conditioning and insulation and other uh, housing infrastructure. Um, so very similar to cancer patients, there's other populations that are also vulnerable to heat waves. And then, uh, exposure to heat is associated with renal morbidity. So you can think about individuals who have been diagnosed with kidney cancer or that are receiving chemotherapy that have uh, nephrotoxic uh, consequences are going to be more vulnerable to these exposures. And similarly with lung cancer, because heat waves can lead to poor air quality and increases metabolic demands, individuals who have been diagnosed with lung cancer are also more sensitive to the threats of heat exposure. So I thought um, that this was more of a, a big picture and, and, and maybe hopefully we can have a little bit of a brainstorming during the discussion sessions of other types of exposure and health consequences that, that we can look at as a, a scientific collaboration uh, using satellite data. That's it, thank you. Thanks so much, Leticia. Um, and, oh, there you are. Yeah, our final speaker in the session is Alberto Ayala uh, from the Sacramento uh, Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. Thank you, Jeffrey. <clears throat> Let me see if I can share my... And here we go. Can you give me a quick uh, thumbs up that you can see it? Yeah, it looks great. Perfect, perfect. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first of all, I wanna, I wanna thank uh, Jeffrey and, and Jenny and Tracy and, and the rest of the HACAS group for the invitation. This is great for us to have the opportunity to to uh, spend uh, today and part of tomorrow with you guys. Um, similar to, to uh, Leticia, the, the previous speaker, um, I, I'm, I like that I go last in this session because I think what I, can, what I can offer in my remarks is what I hope to be a useful uh, backdrop in terms of uh, public policy uh, when it comes to um, air quality management and, and what we are doing uh, uh, with respect to climate change. Um, before I begin, I, I want to acknowledge uh, my, my affiliations. Um, as Jeffrey said, I'm with the uh, SAC Metro Air Quality Management District. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the uh, West Virginia University. Uh, I've spent more than two decades in uh, public policy and, and air quality policy in particular in California, having been uh, with the uh, California Resources Board uh, previously. And the last thing I'll mention as an acknowledgement, because I know there's some participants from the program, you know, I'm happy to report that I'm also uh, a fellow in the uh, Air Quality Fellows Program out of the U.S. State Department. 
and my current assignment is with the U.S. Embassy in Budapest. So, um, with that, let me uh, see how to let me advance the slides. I only have a handful of slides, so uh, again, um, hopefully, we can get to the discussions and the Q and A quickly. But for those of you that may not be uh, familiar, um, I am in the capital of the state of California. And um, in the graphic here, I wanted to indicate uh, what is called the federal non-attainment area in Sacramento. Uh, so again, like many parts in California and, and the rest of, of, of the US, um, you know, we are not in attainment of the uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Uh, there's a lot of work in progress to try to get there, uh, but clearly the challenge is as uh, health science advances, uh, the, uh, the national immune quality standards tend to get more and more stringent, uh, and that keeps all of us uh, in the air quality management business um, on our toes, because clearly we need to come up with uh, better interventions and policies to, to try to meet the standards. Um, like, like other places uh, just mentioned, uh, what is unique about our uh, jurisdiction is that obviously we have a heavily urbanized core, uh, but we also share a very large fraction of uh, rural areas. Uh, and the reason I mentioned that is because it's, it's a really intriguing um, uh, topic when we begin to challenge ourselves and think about all the things that we've been talking about in this, in this meeting the importance of making sure that we make progress on our quality, the important, importance that we tackle the connection of climate change and health and also environmental justice. But when you think about uh, the tendency to think about these topics in the urban core, the rural areas also have environmental justice issues. The rural areas also have air pollution challenges, but they tend to be very different. And, and that is important because those of us in the policy making uh, world, uh, we need to be open uh, to um, thinking of interventions that are that are different, that are that are customized, if you will, to respond to the needs of the rural uh, communities, uh, which again are, are tend to be very different than than the typical intervention that we tend to think about for uh, urban areas. So, uh, obviously, um, being from California, California has been in the business of controlling air pollution for. Uh, from day one, uh, air quality management, air pollution control um, was started, was invented in California out of out of necessity. You know, back in the in the 1950s, uh, give or mind, uh, give or take a few years. Um, and for the first, you know, 50 years, 60 years of, of policy making, the the emphasis was really regional air pollution. Um, as, as we began to recognize more uh, seriously the importance of greenhouse gases and climate change, about 20 years ago, um, the state really began to pay close attention to the control of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, starting with the emissions from uh, motor vehicles and then progressively uh, evolving that program. Um, the prelude to environmental justice also emerged in the mid eighties with something we call a hotspots program. And the hotspots program was really meant to understand and tackle uh, near source exposure to toxic pollution. Um, so the point here is, you know, this, this concept of, of linking uh, conventional air pollution, climate change, and now environmental justice is, is not a new concept. What is different, and I like um, what Tracy said this morning in the opening remark is, we do seem to be at a renaissance of not only um, the topic of this meeting, which is using satellite observations of the planet to help us in our quality and health, but also in what I would say collaboration. I mean, the fact that we're all here talking about these things together, uh, I think that is a bit of a renaissance. The fact that we have taken much more serious action uh, on environmental justice is, is a bit of a renaissance. So I remain very encouraged because I think uh, there is broad understanding at the, um, in academia, uh, in government, uh, at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, that we really need to identify the efficiencies and the synergisms of uh, thinking of interventions at the public policy level that have these multiple co-benefits that we tackle conventional air pollution so we continue to make progress to meet the NAAQS, 
that we also address um, the uh, global warming that we're already uh, suffering from, um, that we pay much more closer attention to localized uh, impacts that for justifiable reason and, and reasons that we understand uh, tend to impact disproportionately certain members of our community. And obviously at the end of the day, it's all predicated on improving community health. So that's, that's really the way that we think about broadly uh, all the programs and, and interventions that we're putting in place. In, in the area of air quality monitoring, um, again, uh, at the risk of overusing the, the term, there, there is a bit of a renaissance as well because we have seen this, this amazing expansion of technology to monitor air quality, right? I mean, uh, we began this, this effort uh, you know, years ago with the regulatory networks. Uh, that agencies like the agency I represent are responsible for. Um, but, you know, these portable sensors that have, have emerged in the marketplace that are readily accessible and very affordable uh, are, are really a game changer in terms of just empowering communities to have access to the data and also empower policymaking uh, makers like myself in terms of being able to engage with communities and talk about solutions uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, these are not the only options, right? I mean, we can, we can develop and have developed and will continue to develop uh, mobile monitoring capabilities that we can you know, take to different places of, of interest. Um, obviously there is uh, new technology and uh, you know, be, being from California down, down, the, down the street, down the way from uh, Silicon Valley, you know, I love the, that, that the innovation in terms of air quality is also alive and well. Um, I point to the approach that Aclima has, has marketed and, and developed, where you get very localized, high precision, block by block community level monitoring. Uh, and that is information that, that folks like us can, can use to try to come up with solutions uh, for communities. Obviously, uh, airborne observations are, are also very viable. And then the topic of, of this meeting obviously is, is to, to think about how do we maximize and optimize the use of satellite uh, uh, observations for, for air quality. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a new day when it comes to air quality monitoring. Uh, it's definitely a, a good day in terms of the availability of information, the, the, how readily it is available to, to our communities uh, and those who care about making progress. I think there are some things that we need to be very mindful of, and that is with technology, it's very easy to get a device, push a button and get a number but it's much more important to understand what that number really means. So I think we all have a responsibility uh, to sort of think about, you know, what is the, the right way to engage with those that we wanna protect in, in our communities? Because again, uh, community members and those that we wanna protect are not air quality specialists, are not, you know, atmosphere chemistry specialists. So for us to be able to speak apples to apples, there, ne there needs to be a recognition that capacity building plays a really key role. And then of course, the last point I'll make, this is my last slide is, um, you know, I've been around this, this, this space for, for many years, as I said, and, and I've always said, I wanna be put out of business. And what I, what, I, what I mean by that is, you know, to me, the holy grail of air quality monitoring would be to fully rely and be fully uh, uh, capable of using satellite observations for all the things that we need to do to control air pollution on the ground. Um, you know, we can debate the point, maybe it's a pipe dream, uh, maybe we'll get there. I've been very encouraged by some of the talks today and the things that I'm learning about, about uh, what HECAS is, is doing and, and will be able to do for us. But really to me is, you know, those of us that have responsibility to maintain um, uh, air quality monitoring networks uh, that are ground-based. Um, I think we do need to be open to a future, hopefully not distant future, where we could uh, use these um, amazing new tools to do the job that we're man mandated to do by the Federal Clean Air Act. There is going to be inertia, right? Historical and otherwise to kind of you know, keep the status quo and maintain the, the, the networks. Uh, but I think the day has come for us to, to seriously contemplate, you know, how do we take um, attainment and everything that goes under that per the Federal Clean Air Act, how do we take it to the next level so that we can fully utilize uh, these new and amazing tools that, that are coming on, online, including 
uh, more observations from, from the satellite fleet that NASA is uh, making available to us. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I thank you for the invitation and I look forward to the, uh, to the questions. Thanks so much, Alberto. Um, so now we'll move into our question and answer period. We have about 25 minutes or so to the end of the session. Um, you can put questions either in the, in the question and answer um, area or in the chat towards the host and panelists and, and I can monitor both. Um, the first question, there's two questions here, but I'll, I'll start with one and then see if there's other questions and then can bounce around. So this is from Jonathan Patz and it's for Yang. And uh, he's asking, how are you accounting for the long lag time of lung cancer versus the frequency of moving between homes within the US? Uh, thanks, uh, Jeff and Jonathan, for that question. Uh, let me clarify that, uh, first of all, we're not um, associating wildfires with the, the onset or the incidence of lung cancer. Uh, we are evaluating the impact of wildfire exposure, direct or indirect, on the efficacy of treatment or how long people, what, or what that exposure affect people's survival after treatment, right? Um, and then, the, I, mean, I mean, Leticia's here, and she's the true expert on, on this. I'm just kind of uh, provide a summary. And then the second question is, uh, the, the frequency of moving is captured in the uh, National Cancer Database, you know, annually. So we fact that we'll factor that, and then in fact the uh, uh, the, the IP model data set is constructed as as uh, uh, monthly uh, records of exposure. Right. So if there is a address change, it, it is going to be reflected for the monthly, you know, multiple records per patient. Um, uh, Leticia, do you want to add? Yeah, definitely. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Definitely moving is, is a big problem when, whenever we're looking at long-term exposure to pollutants that end up to lead to uh, cancer diagnosis, as uh, Yang was saying, incidents. However, we are, uh, by restricting the analysis to a short period of survival after uh, cancer surgery, a lung cancer uh, resection, uh, we limit uh, the issue of moving somewhat. Um, and as we were talking about individuals that have been diagnosed with cancer are vulnerable or more sensitive to these types of exposures. And, and we know that um, depending on, on the type and stage of cancer that you're diagnosed, um, most patients have a, a, a very low uh, five-year survival uh, probability. So with that, we're limiting our data analysis to two years after surgery because of post-operative complications. We expect that around this time is when patients would be most vulnerable um, to uh, exposure to wildfires. And that kind of gets to at, at this issue um, of uh, trying to look at different populations that are vulnerable and that are not necessarily exposed uh, during 10 years or more, which is what we are usually looking at when we're looking at incidents. Thanks both of you for that great answer. Um, so there's another part to it, but I'll hold off for now to mix up who gets to speak. So Arlene has a question in the chat for Alberto. Um, and I really like this question because it's about interventions and what can we do? So she says, we'd love to hear more about the different types of interventions needed for rural versus urban areas. Are these interventions things like having cooling centers for during heat events, being able to distribute masks for during welfare smoke events and so on? Thank you. I, I, I love the question because, um, thank you for the question, Arlene. Um, what I mean is you need to, we need to think about different interventions at all level. What Arlene is pointing to are very specific responses to events, to impacts, right? But one could argue that precisely the same things that she's suggesting, we need to do in the urban course as well. So what I mean by different interventions is, for example, um, one of the principal strategies when we start talking about uh, air pollution and climate change is, is what do we wanna do? We wanna uh, electrify transportation, which is the largest source of, of, of air and climate emissions. We want infield development. We want transit oriented development. We want uh, non-combustion non vehicle use mobility uh, solution for our residents, right? So we want all these strategies that we're all very 
uh, accustomed to seeing in policy documents from the state and federal and and even uh, the the COP uh, 26 discussions, right? But when you try to apply these interventions at the highest level in terms of policy, they look very different in rural areas, right? I mean, how do you do transit-oriented development in a rural area where you don't have the density to even support transit? Um, how do you do infield development in a rural area when you don't have the density to do that? So that's what I mean by that. And you know, those of us working in this space have been doing a lot of thinking and soul searching and learning about not only getting accustomed to thinking about these different uh, th these uh, differences, but also taking the risk and be willing to, if you, if anything, I mean, just learn about you know we we do need to be mindful that the one size fits all that may actually satisfy what is needed in the urban course is, is not going to do it for the rest of, of, of the country, which is, as we know, <laughs> very rural. Yeah, thanks for that great answer. Um, appreciate this. Um, there's a question in the question and answer from Sal Sarah Cal Calamari. Um, I suspect it's for probably for Leticia and Le Yang, but it could be for anyone who has thoughts on this. So. Um, is health data, which is categorized for an example, for example, cause, region, et cetera, and at different temporal resolutions, is that readily available so that it can be linked to air quality for all the USA? And are there any comments on the uncertainty of concentration response functions that are typically used? Uh, Leticia, you want to take these happy questions? <laughs> yes, yeah, so that is definitely... Um something we, st we struggle with daily um, at the American Cancer Society. Because of HIPAA, any health information, any patient information is highly protected. Um, and just getting the, the location of the patient is, is sometimes extremely hard. So I think that this is one of the reasons why we don't know more about these exposures or, or there are not many um, health data sets that we can use and, and link with uh, data from NASA. Um, so I, I think that before we start calibrating on how um, granular the, the, the data is, we really need to think about how health data is being collected and how it's being used. And is it being used to improve access to care or improve health outcomes for the population? And many times all you have from uh, uh, the data source is the uh, state or the area, which is not granular enough for some of these exposures that we're looking at. Um, I don't know if that gets at your question or, or if, if you needed me to be more specific about um, any of the... Um, I, I can say a little bit about the second part of the question, which is the uh, uncertainty or the, you know, the confidence interval around the concentration response functions. Um, I mean, the way at least I use it is to factor that into the, uh, uh, the burden estimation or the health impact assessment. Um, and what we do is to conduct, you know, either simple Monte Carlo simulation or some, some sampling of the a version of the Monte Carlo simulation to uh, allow that uncertainty be reflected in the final estimation of the disease burden. So we know um, there is a range of the health risks, and then that range is gonna be translated into the range of the health impact. So in fact, it, along the entire chain of the analysis, we try to factor in as, as much uncertainty as possible in every step. Thanks both. And, and Leticia, you had asked if um, that answered the question and Sarah wrote again, saying that answers the question and thanking you. Um, I wanna ask Arlene a question. Oh, go ahead, Arlene. Go ahead. I was, I was just gonna um, kind of mention or maybe add or, or like ask Yang a question about the uncertainty in the health um, exposure response functions in that my understanding is that in the health community, the uncertainty is to date are largely on the response side and not so much on the exposure side and that they getting the uncertainty from the exposure 
factored in too is um is kind of another component and that that's my understanding of what this uh, project that Marianthi has been uh, Marianthi Anakimortsoglu my co I who's an epidemiologist has been spearheading um so to try to link the range of uncertainty in the exposure products and the uncertainty in the health and then propagate all of that through I guess the health site. is that fair Yang um well I it it, it there has been a you know, there has been a long debate on that and how to factor in the uncertainty on exposure side. Because currently in the API analysis, we use the mean estimate, like a fixed number as the true exposure without considering the fact that that exposure is an estimate itself. I mean, there are ways to kind of carry forward the uh, exposure uncertainty through the API analysis. Um, but it, I, I, I mean, as far as I know, it, it hasn't been widely adopted. Um, yeah, I've seen some where there are people have a few different exposure estimates through different methods, and they care, they show their epi result differences based on when they estimate it from satellites or from a CTM. Mm -hmm. It's one way, but it's still it's 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 pretty chunked. It only like maybe two or three. Estimates. Yeah. Uh, Right, so so it, you know that involves the assumption or hypothesis of the error structure. You know, is that uncertainty actually following a certain distribution, or can you sample on that distribution using some some Bayesian Bayesian methodology, and sort of carry it through the inference into the dose response? Right, um, it, it's it's pretty tough <laughs> to say, and very time consuming to do. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I want to ask Arlene a question. Um, so you showed the really cool analysis using both retrievals of formaldehyde and NO2 to not only get information about those species, but then to infer some of the chemistry that's going on at the surface and how air quality managers might be able to make decisions. Um, where do you see the frontiers of that? Like where, like when tempo goes up or other things, you know, as we're getting potentially more able to get retrievals of more species. Um, do, do you have a vision for what the future might be for actually understanding processes uh, that, that drive atmospheric chemistry from, from these retrievals? Yeah, thanks for the question. We're super excited about Tempo and the opportunity to watch how the chemistry evolves throughout the course of the day. Of the day. And I actually appreciate your question to clarify that we've the conditions we're focusing on are summer afternoons when we expect the chemistry to be probably at its peak sensitivity to NOx. We have a well mixed boundary layer. Anyways, we I'll try not to go on for too long here. Um, and and so um, I, I think with Tempo, we will have the opportunity to watch the full diurnal cycle evolve. And so we we expect um, to start out potentially less NOx sensitive or more, you know, in the urban core area. You know, it looks like even in the afternoon in New York City, we're still v VOC saturated. Um, but in other regions, it may be that the morning uh, starts out that way, and then uh, sort of you cycle through the course of the day as your radiation picks up, your boundary layer increases. There's a lot of processes there to disentangle, and so I do. I think I think that it's a really exciting opportunity to be able to have the spatial and temporal resolution of not you know multiple products of relevant here that can help us disentangle, you know, what's the role of the meteorology, um, what's the role of the, the chemistry. Um, so yeah, so I think it's pretty exciting. And of course, the, you know, what I didn't mention is that, and should probably clarify, this is really about the local photochemistry. But of course, if we're thinking about ozone, we also want to understand what's being transported as well. So there's a lot of processes to try to unravel. Thanks so much. That, that's great. Um, we have the second question um, for for Yang and Leticia from Jonathan Patz, and, and this is how you are you factoring for adjacent years and adjacent locations of fire. That is, large fire is going to consume the fuel uh, that you know is going to take out the fuel for a following number of years, changing changing the risk for wildfire in that location. Leticia. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, again, we're looking from date of surgery about one or two years of follow up from the date of surgery. So uh, it could be that a patient uh, has surgery in, in the year following a big wildfire and there is no fuel. And in that case, that patient would end up being in the uh, unexposed group for our study. Um, 
So I think that that's the, the easiest way to think about it. You have about two years to be exposed to a wildfire right after your surgery. And um, of course, we're taking into consideration the age and comorbidities and some of the socioeconomic factors of the area. But if a wildfire already consumes the fuel around you, then you're just going to be on the unexposed group. Thanks. And, and we can kind of build off this because you posed that question at the end of your talk, Letitia, on what exposures do we need to be considering related to this beyond smoke and beyond direct fire? And maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but one thing I know that's been a concern in Colorado after we've had fires is that there's then the, the debris from the fires is then in the watersheds uh, that, that goes to our drinking water. And um, I can't remember if that was something you mentioned, but like, is there a way, have you thought of ways to factor in contamination in people's water sources? And it's a great question. And, and I think something that, um is becoming more and more discussed of water contamination. I think since Flint, it has been, but um, it is very hard. It's usually uh, the data is managed by each state. So it's very hard to get a comprehensive uh, measure of, of exposure and, it, and the way it's measured and who is uh, consuming that water varies a lot. So I think that maybe it is not going to be solved by satellite data, but uh, it's definitely a very valid question. Yeah, good, good point. I mean, I guess we can, we can see from the burn scar data what, what watershed it's in, but then, yeah, the exposure, jump, but going from that to who's in, Yeah, who's yeah. going to consume the water is a, is a little harder to get it. B building on your question, do other people have thoughts they want to jump in on, on when there are fires, what's, what sort of other exposures do we need to be thinking about? So here in, um, uh, not too far from where I am, was the fire that burned through cities recently. Um, and I know people, people probably, many, many of us know who work in Boulder, you know, were displaced. I, and, and some of them may have lost their homes and whatnot. But then as they go back, like I'm, I also wonder about, I guess it's, it, it might not be water itself, but there's probably contamination of ash on the land from structures burned that, that Kids, kids playing outside and stuff are then being exposed to. Maybe you were, you were getting at that because you were talking about the, the man-made, human, human yeah. genetic materials. Not just biomass, but man-made materials. Absolutely, and there are so many contaminants in that. And I think that children are especially vulnerable. We know smaller bodies, higher metabolism. Of course, they put everything in their mouths. Um, so I think that that's definitely an area of concern. and. Uh, Again, hard to measure exactly what is around them and who is being exposed, but an extremely relevant question. Any other thoughts on Leticia's question? So there's a question and a, and a comment in the chat. So I'll go to the comment first because it's on a, it's something we had already discussed and that comes from Kevin Cromar. Um, so, he says the general assumption is that errors in exposure assessment bias, bias health results towards the null. Um, so this is regarding, I think, Yang's and Arlene's discussion about you know, what happens when you have uncertainties in exposure. This doesn't mean it wouldn't be valuable to incorporate errors in exposure health analysis, but why, why isn't it has been pr prioritized? So if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, Kevin's saying that when you have, if you have random errors in your exposure, it's going to make your odds ratio that you find be closer to nothing, be, be, be closer to one. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if, the, if the measurement error, exposure error uh, falls under the category of classical error, that is generally true because exposure, ran, random exposure misclassification tends to bias the uh, dose response relationship towards the null. Um, now, spatially, you know, spatial estimates of exposure is partially classical, partially Bergson. Uh, so it, it gets into pretty complex error structure and how the Bergson error would actually, the direction that the Bergson error would actually bias the dose response function. Um, and then another kind of a opinion or hypothesis is that uh, when you have multiple exposure data sets, it would actually affect the uh, dose response estimate, you would have a hard time finding the optimal dose response because it would actually alter your dose response relationship. 
So there's this, this, you know, this causal debate, you know, who's determining what? How do you decide what those responses is optimal or, or is accurate, so you know, quote unquote. Uh, uh, I mean, it, and, and it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's a pretty active uh, research area in terms of you know, how you handle measurement error. Um, but the, you know, the classical, I agree that the, the classical view is it's less of an issue if it's more random, that the error is more random. Thanks. And, and there's a related comment from Sarah Johnson uh, along the same lines of uncertainties in concentration response functions and exposure. Um, and she says, we use estimated health benefits from health impact assessments all the time for policy development in New York City. We found that the exact numbers aren't really that essential or is magnitude or sufficient. So it depends on what you plan to use the numbers for. All right, so Jenny in the chat has a question for Alberto. So she asks, in your opinion, how well do existing policies centered on air quality address greenhouse gas emissions and climate change? Um, thank you for the question. Um, for the most part, um, when, for the most part, I think air quality policies um, uh, do lead to co-benefits of, of greenhouse gas emission reductions. But, but I qualify the question because we really have to be mindful and, and careful because that is not necessarily always the case. So let me give you an example. If we think about the biggest source of air and climate pollution, the transportation sector, and if we think of the most, uh, the ideal uh, strategy, electrification, then you know, if you take out the combustion engine and you put in a, a, an electric powertrain, you're gonna take care of air pollution and greenhouse gases. But um, using the, the transportation sector as an example, that is not always the case. For example, uh, back in the early days, um, the state was uh, a big promoter of biodiesel, right? And interestingly enough, uh, biodiesel may have climate and, and other benefits, but it led to an increase in NOx emissions. And as you all know, the biggest challenge that we've had in California for many years is ozone, right? So it really led to some really quirky uh, treatment of, of you know, promoting one policy for one benefit while trying to think about how do we mitigate a, 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 you know, a, a, an ozone impact that, that, that wasn't there if it wasn't for this particular policy. More recently, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you guys another intervention that is really important, low carbon fuels, right? The state has been promoting low carbon fuels and we have a low carbon fuel standard and we are pushing the Biden administration to, to make the California standard national. But as somebody who spent a significant amount of my research career um, studying emissions, the way I think about low carbon fuels is that's a great climate solution because in many cases you have carbon negative solutions. But at the end of the day, combustion is combustion. So I don't care if you have a net, net carbon negative fuel, if you're gonna burn it in something, you're probably going to lead to some combustion that is not gonna be good for anybody, any one of us to be breathing. So um, that's sort of uh, the way I think about this, this question that Jenny posed is, is really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Alberto. The only other thing I see in the questions in chat is that John, Jonathan Pat's circle back. I think this was to the um, answer on the adjacent locations of fires. And um, he said the question was regarding the Lancet countdown, not cancer. So I think this is Yang, your, your trends, maybe the. Um, well, I guess that's what he meant. Um... Yeah, we we don't really factor in that into our uh, countdown reporting. Um, I mean, the wildfire exposure indicator is is a proxy at best to measure national level trends. Where report the the uh, official report is done at the national level, um, so it's trying to get to the kind of the overall pattern, whether or not uh, wildfire has been increasing or decreasing and where, uh, which part of the world has been most badly uh, affected. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot to think about uh, what is 
you know, what's the best indicator of climate impact on wildfire and how that affects health. Right, and, and certainly detangling this from fuel fuels changes is gonna become increasingly important in the future when we get into high wildfire regimes and ecosystems change and, and, mm -hmm. and so on, those things. But yeah, I agree. Over the time period you're looking at, I would, I would guess we were not fuel limited for the most part, yeah. Yeah, so we're reporting four-year averages, you know, multi-year averages compared with the kind of the baseline of early 2000s. All right, so this is actually a great timing. Um, so this is about time for, I guess, what is it, a 15-minute break? Jenny, do you wanna? Yeah, we're about to have a 30-minute break. 30-minute break. Um, so yeah, if um, we have a couple minutes left here, so if um, our panelists have any final remarks that you didn't get to say, you wanna chime in, um, please do so. Well, I really wanna thank the speakers for great talks and great discussion. I wanna thank everyone who asked a question. Um, this is it was a great session and um, Unless I see anything pop up in the next few seconds, I'll see you all in, in 30 minutes.